Hello ladies and gents, it's Hagbard Celine here on another beautiful afternoon, and today I would like to start by saying thank you so much for the outpouring of support on my last video. It was overwhelming and there's absolutely no way I could have gotten to all of your comments. It was it was so nice to, to open that up and see that, thanks guys. That out of the way, I'd also like to apologize again for the sound quality on that video and know that I will I will do my best in the future not to allow something quite that bad to happen again. A brief update for those that did get through it and are concerned, my brother is home, he is stable, he is on dialysis until either his kidneys get better or we jam a new one in him, more than likely one of mine. So we'll see how that goes. But news and updates out of the way, on with the show! Today I was made aware of and read an article entitled The End of Identity Liberalism, written by Mark Leah. Now, Mark Leah is part of the faculty of the Columbia University. He is a professor of humanities, and I'm actually quite familiar with him. I've seen several of his recorded lectures, and I like his work. I haven't read his newest work, although I have read The Stillborn God, Religion, Politics, and the Modern West. I know, shocking, right? That said, I was made aware and read this article as an aside, after having been made aware of an article written by one of his colleagues at Columbia University named Catherine Frank or Frankie I I honestly have no idea if the E is silent and frankly I don't give a shit entitled making white supremacy respectable again I imagine it's in reference to make America great again and in it the accusations are slanderous and I decided I had to make a video mocking it because that's how I vent my frustrations so join me before we get to the main piece, I would like to read an excerpt from the review of her book about how equality is actually inequality. And this is why I find Frankie's account and her choice to avoid the 14th Amendment and its egalitarian promises so compelling. It shows the practical threats that endure beyond the decision of the Supreme Court or the passage of a single law. As Frankie's exquisitely demonstrates, a network of laws shape our social lives, and not all of these are equally visible or enforced. Phrased another way, equality under the law has dangers of its own. That's right, these people don't like the concept of equality under the law. Last Friday, two tweets were posted to my feed within minutes of each other. David Duke tweeted, Bannon, Flynn, Sessions. Great, Senate must demand that Sessions as AG stop the massive institutional racism against whites. Yes, I follow David Duke on Twitter. I now follow many right-wing sites. I learn more from them than I do from the echo chamber of Facebook. Well, if you've learned nothing else, at least I guess you've learned that to maybe look outside of your own social group, but... And the New York Times tweeted out Mark Lila's opinion piece, The I End of Identity Liberalism. In the new political climate we now inhabit, Duke and Leah are contributing to the same ideological project. Okay, so you've now conflated two people, completely separate and unassociated individuals, tweets with the same ideological project. Whew, lady, you're, uh, you're stretching a bit here, aren't you? The former in a cloaked KKK hood and the latter in an academic gown. Both men are underwriting the whitening of an American nationalism and a recentering of white lives as lives that matter the most in the US. Or at all. Or that that would be even be something you could say without being called a racist, but no, let's ignore that. Duke is happy to own the white supremacy of his statements, while Leah, op-ed, does more nefarious background work of making white supremacy respectable. A Again, Mark, Leah, and I both teach at Columbia University, and I acknowledge that this is a harsh indictment of my colleague, but these are harsh times. Leah's op-ed makes the argument for the commonalities between Americans, arguing we have to move to a post-identity liberalism. Pfft, like I could have any power in that society. Exactly, you see? You see, I, I added that last part, but you see how easily it flowed? It, it adds up pretty easily. Refocusing our attention away from identities to broader, more abstract ideas of citizenship. Oh, so you know, she doesn't like that at all, because that excludes Mexican people or anybody not a citizen of the United States. And that's wasis. Everyone knows not everyone being a citizen of your nation implicitly makes you a wasis. Narrower issues, like the right to choose a bathroom, should be worked on quietly and sensitively, so as not to scare away potential allies. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he wasn't bringing that up. He didn't talk about the right to choose a bathroom, and everyone has a right to choose a bathroom. 
Just yesterday, the men's room was crowded. I used the ladies' room. You know who said something? Not a person. This argument, put simply, trivializes several generations of civil rights organizing in the service of a breathing life into dying corpse of political neoliberalism. What a curious time to take up that project on the pages of the New York Times, just 10 days after an election that delivered the White House to Donald Trump, an avowed racist, sexist, Islamophobic nationalist and vulture capitalist who defeated a person who made the best and losing case for neoliberalism. It turns out, Leah argues, that Clinton's loss can be blamed on the moral failure of identity politics, which never wins elections. Yeah, we'll see next time. We'll see if we can't get identity politics to win next time. Leah blames people of color, women, and gay and trans people for Trump's election. A repugnant outcome, he concedes. Yeah, you know he's reveling in it. He loves it. It's secret, closeted, KKK, white supremacist, bigot, cishet male. Disgusting. By his telling, left movements have indulged a narcissistic moral panic of identity that has devolved into whining about trivial complaints of invisibility, exclusion, and an obsession with petty individual feelings. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what's happened, but you say you've looked outside your little bubble, but you, you clearly appear to be incapable of processing the things that you're seeing outside of this bubble. But whatever. This attachment to a counterproductive politics of identity and personal grievance, he argues, diverts our attention from the more important project of defending a collective commitment to a pre-civil rights era notion of a national personality. I don't think that he's implying a pre-civil rights notion. You're putting that in there. This grander, trans-historical idea of nation is unmarked by difference and is strengthened by an attachment to shared liberal values. This is a bad thing, obviously. He argues that students brought up on discussions of identity and diversity have shockingly little to say about such perennial questions as class, war, the economy, and the common good, as if these forms of political discourse have nothing to do with one another. No, they're just not the main basis, and you selectively quoting his article proves that you're doing that on purpose. You know that he meant it should not form the basis. He further clarifies in the article that that's not the case. Talking about identity, or better yet, status-based power. Oh, okay, so now identity and status are equal. Because there have been no powerful black people and no powerful women, because identity and status are, are equal, right? Oh, you're just switching that up because you know your case is too weak if you stick to the idea of identity politics and don't make it into a class thing which is what he was talking about. Does not preclude discussions of class, war, the economy, or the common good. And while Leah grants that women's right movement was real and important, an acknowledgement that resonates more as mansplaining than munificence, any benefits that may have been achieved by the women's or other social justice movements are premised upon the founding father's achievement in establishing a system of government based on the guarantee of rights. Yeah. Okay, last I checked, the Founding Fathers denied the women the right to vote, the right to equal protection of the laws, indeed, even the full rights of citizenship at the founding of this great nation. It was a woman's right movement that forced a correction in the liberal structure created by the Founding Fathers. Even worse, the Founding Fathers both countenanced and participated in the enslavement of black people. As did the women. Just ignore that, though. It's fine. Counting them as three-fifths of a person in the Constitution and building a modern liberal economy on the barbaric commodification of human life. But, as Leah tells it, this history, indeed, the present facts of inequality, distort and degrade the noble purpose of American liberalism. <laughs> American. A liberal commitment to what we all have in common, rather than a divisiveness of difference or diversity, will set us on the right track, argues Leah. He's obviously insane. He lauds President Reagan and Clinton's skillful mastery of politics and shared destiny. If it's liberal values that matter in this telling, then facts become less important. Facts such as Reagan dismantling the social welfare system, or Clinton's crime policy that resulted in the unprecedented mass incarceration of people of color. Yeah. It's, it's not like the mass incarceration of people of color had to do with the crimes these people of color were committing. No, not at all. As you read this, you feel like people of color, women and gay people are just ruining it for everyone by focusing so much on themselves and on the negative. I mean, come on guys, the Founding Fathers created a really great country, get with the program. You literally cry about rights being given to people. That is what your book is about, the book you wrote 
Catherine is about how giving marriage rights to slaves when they were freed was actually a form of social control, and that that same form of social control will be enacted on homosexuals due to the Marriage Equality Act. Do you understand how crazy you are, Catherine? I sincerely hope that you do. Let me be blunt. This kind of liberalism is a liberalism of white supremacy. It is a liberalism that regards the efforts of people of color and women to call out the forms of power that sustain white supremacy and patriarchy as a distraction. You are a distraction, and you can't point anything out that you can do anything about. You just, you just cry. You just, you just do exactly this. You, you whine. It is a liberalism that figures the lives and interests of a white man as the neutral, unmarked terrain around which politics of common interest can and should be built. Instead, we should build them around the politics and common interests of people still living in sub-Saharan Africa. Obviously, their political structures are just as valid and should be respected and allowed to live among our common interests, right? And it is a liberalism that regards the protests of people of color and women as a complaint or feeling, ignoring the facts upon which those protests are based. Facts about real dead, tortured, raped, and starving bodies. The liberalism Leah espouses reduces these facts of human suffering and the systems of power that produce that suffering as beside the point. What matters are liberal values and the idea of America as a shining on a hill. That deserves our allegiance, not our protest. The ways that racial inequality have been baked into liberalism throughout the structural disadvantage of black people found in the GI Bill, they weren't. The GI Bill was equally given to everyone. Discriminatory lending policies, redlining, inferior education for people of color, and oh right, the refusal to provide reparations to formerly enslaved people are just glitches and not actual features of the splendors of liberal governance for the likes of Leah. I love how they use tech words without knowing shit about tech. This woman's a lawyer, by the way. And here she is using words like baked in and the glitches versus features metaphor. Yeah, you don't get to do that. You're not a techie. You're a dyke lawyer. Try again. Leah's evidence takes the form of a thought experiment launched while on sabbatical in France, while he spent a year reading Le Monde and sipping espressos on a cafes in Paris, all paid for by Columbia, an identity drama, as he describes it, was taking place. Yet your loathing and, I mean, jealousy for this man drips off your words. You know that, right? You clearly have some serious, personal, deep-seated problems with this person. I mean, it's clear. In Ferguson and Staten Island, where Michael Brown and Eric Gardner were murdered. In Hempstead, Texas, where Sandra Bland was found dead in her cell. And on streets across the country, where an epidemic of the murder of trans women of color was taking place. All bullshit. While Leah grants that reading about the fate of transgender people in Egypt may be interesting, it contributes nothing, he argues, to our understanding of the more important issues of Egypt's political future. Aside from blithely reducing the fate of actual people to a measure of casual interest, FYI, that's what the articles do. When you write a whole article, and it's like, this is the fate of a transgender person in Egypt, nobody actually cares. What they've done is reduce that person to a freak show. They've reduced that person to something of interest, just a, just a little interest piece for somebody who's never been to Egypt, never going to go to Egypt, just some, some wife, uh, wife who's, who's bored and sitting at home, or some dude on the toilet. That's who's reading that. This is not a big deal. The fact that you think it is is frightening. Leah's premise displays shockingly little interest in or familiarity with the ways in which dictators use their vulnerable populations, LGBT people, women, ethnic religious minorities, to advance larger state projects. Former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak and current President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi have both used the spectacular persecution of gay men and trans women as a ploy to legitimize and strengthen the expansion of an authoritarian state power to exercise from Egyptian society a convenient symbol of British colonial contamination. Yeah, what you're not getting to is earlier you were crying about identity politics. Yeah, this is a hatred for British people and white people in Egypt and the desire to expel all things white like they do in South Africa, or Zimbabwe, and we've seen how well that goes. 
In fact, President Sisi's mass arrests of LGBT people and infiltration of gay chat rooms are quite clearly the leading edge of a government effort to shut down freedom of expression and sites of resistance to authoritarian rule in Egypt, fueled by the proliferation of internet chat rooms and websites that lie beyond the regime's easy control. The persecution of LGBT rights has played a key role in crushing efforts to bring about liberal democratic reform in Egypt. Yes, the gays have led the way in Egypt, obviously. The Egyptian case quite clearly illustrates the essential connection between identity politics and authoritarian governance. Yes, because when you're first and foremost loyal to those like you within your identity, that's way healthier than first and foremost being loyal to a government or system of governance or some form of a national identity. That's unhealthy. Being obsessed with being gay, perfectly healthy. Being obsessed with your race, if you're not white, perfectly healthy. If you're white or you're an American and you feel good about that, fuck off, you're, you're a racist and a bigot. You, sh you should be killed. Thus, I read in shocked disbelief Leah's coy condemnation of media coverage of a human rights violation suffered by transgender people in Egypt as a mere identity drama that contributes nothing to educating Americans about the powerful political and religious currents that will determine Egypt's future and indirectly our own. Yet what he's saying is, is that you're using these people as a prop to get attention. Because you know that in the West people particularly care about women, trans people, gay people, LGBT, etc., etc., etc. And if you write the story, Egypt persecutes population, yada, 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 less people will read it than if you make it about a certain subgroup of people which people care more about. How is this difficult for you to pro- oh, never mind. This statement is not only blatantly inaccurate, it displays an incapacity, or worse, unwillingness to conceptualize power in complex ways. Yeah, the person that is promoting identity politics cannot complain about simplification of power. To be fair, Leah's celebration of what he calls post-identity liberalism recognizes some merit in the work of Black Lives Matter and the gay rights movement. That's real white supremacy. Yeah, that's believable to the original premise of this piece that he's equal to a KKK member, but he's using academia. Yeah, now that makes sense. But a careful reader will note any benefit they have achieved is measured by its value to people like Leah, white, hetero men. Black Lives Matter has delivered a wake-up call to every American with a conscience. Translation, white people, aka Americans with a conscience, have been given a window into the reality of the daily violent racism with which black people live amongst themselves to each other. Oh wait, no. Hollywood's efforts to normalize homosexuality in our popular culture helped to normalize it in American families and public life. Translation, the LGBTQ plus rights movement is reduced to a plotline, think will and grace, that rendered us worthy of straight American families' tolerance. You realize that you are some of the most spoiled cunts on the planet, right? Reading this actually makes me angry, like I started this trying to be funny and I, it's just, I hit a wall. This isn't funny, you're obnoxious. The fact that you think I should implicitly give a fuck about any of this is the problem and you still can't see it. The fact that you think it's my responsibility to access and solve these problems is the problem. You realize that, right? Like, you're fuck whitey now help. How is this gonna work? Wait, what? Leah closes with an homage to the real foundations of modern American liberalism. Franklin Ro Roosevelt's Four Freedoms. He recounts with sheer delight academics would call joissance. Yes, he was happy at the celebration of Roosevelt's America. Is that a problem? In a way designed to induce the reader to surrender to a familiar sentiment. Yes, let's make America great like that again. You see, she was indeed referencing Donald Trump via Roosevelt's speech. Jesus, the fact that you guys kick back against that phrase and that phrase alone reveals so much about your mentality. Roosevelt's speech in 1941 was a call to arms, providing the ideological basis for U.S. involvement in World War II. A month after Roosevelt's Four Freedom speech, Bruce Tisdale, a 27-year-old African-American man, was lynched in Georgetown, South Carolina by five white men who were outraged that Tisdale had taken their jobs at a lumber mill. How is that related? You just, because it happened and along the same timeline, it's related to the sentiments of the presidential speech there? Or does it just negate it? Does the fact that five white dudes lynched a black guy in 1941, does that negate that presidential speech? Or the sentiments therein? Because if so, I've got several other crimes that I could, I could show you. One of the unemployed white men 
Ooh, see, now we're getting to the demographics issue. One of the unemployed white men accused of crime asked why the white man couldn't work and the mm -hmm. could. It's just mm -hmm in a line. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just, you're not putting a word in my head. You don't get to do that. You own what you're saying or you don't fucking put it. American liberalism in 1941 took little mind of the lynchings of black men or of Jim Crow segregation, just as the American liberalism celebrated by Leah today takes little mind of the forms of structural racism that permeate the lives of his students, whom he ridicules as narcissistically unaware of conditions outside their self-defined groups. Leah would be well advised to consider the same critique of his own celebration of white liberalism. Oh good, white feminism, white liberal. Hey, at least white people get stuff again. I mean, at some point, white people are just going to embrace that. You know that, right? And then you have to deal with the repercussions of your actions. And I'll go sit in the woods and laugh. So you get to deal with that. With Jeff Sessions, we have an avowed white supremacist assuming the post of attorney general. And we should be hyper alert to the consequences of having his ideology driving policy from that office. At the same time, scholars such as Mark Leah are doing the more nuanced ideological work that enables the ascent to power of a man like Sessions, rendering Sessions' white supremacy not only acceptable, but respectable. On what planet, my dear, do you think that these two people are even tertially related? And the fact that you have to just paint all of these people and jam them together with David Duke does not strengthen your argument. Not only that, I would like to say that this final statement here, where they say that one person is in power and the other person is doing the ideological background work that enables the ascension of power of the person using the opposite form of identity politics, even if true, is just irritating to you because apparently they did it better than your side did. Because this is exactly what you guys have been doing from your positions. This is exactly what you're continuing to do right now. So imagine, you've changed nothing. But hey, you get to feel like a hero. That's what we all want, right? Well, that's it for me, ladies and gents. I tried to make this irritating article funny, but I'm not sure if I succeeded. At very least, I hope that you understand that we're dealing with probably a few years of hearing these people cry. And I don't see it rolling to an end anytime soon. I haven't seen many people that I've talked to personally that have come to terms with the why on any of this or the continued repercussions that are inevitable if this continues. But I'll catch up with you guys later this week, presuming no major medical incidences bar that being the case. I'd like to thank everyone once again for the outpouring of support. And I'd like to thank you guys for continuing to support this channel. I am super close to 20,000 subscribers. I'll be doing a stream then, which should be fun. And this is one of the rare instances that I will slide some e-begging in. Uh, we could use some help. If you have a couple bucks to throw at my Patreon, that wouldn't, that wouldn't hurt things. That's it for me, folks. Stay safe, good luck, and goodbye. <laughs>